Yeah, let's give it up for the band leading us in worship today. First time to rattle in this building. That's kind of a, a theme song for our church. Uh, very, very awesome uh, experience. Still, the newness um, hasn't worn off yet. Um, a lot of people are telling me that it feels like we're in someone else's home. Um, I don't know if you guys have that feeling, but it is, a, it is strange to be in the new land. Um, I want to welcome everyone, and I know that we have guests today. Um, you were supposed to wait till next week, but we'll... We'll allow it. Um, next week is our grand opening, and we are super excited about that. Um, those last, these last two weeks, they told me, you know, that I could preach on whatever I wanted, which that sounds, that sounds fun, um, but I'm used to preaching in series, and so we kind of move chronologically through stories or we cover a topic in depth. Um, so it's actually a little bit more difficult because uh, I'm kind of a robot um, on how and what, because when you've been preaching for 30 years and you say, preach whatever you want, man, there's so, like, so many sermons that I would love to preach uh, to you guys today. But I think I, I landed on one uh, that is, is where we need to be today. So as a pastor, you're constantly trying to figure out a couple of things. You're trying to figure out what is God what is God trying to say to me this week, right? Because if God isn't communicating anything to me, then how am I going to commu communicate anything to you? Because you don't want to hear what I have to say. I think you want to hear what God has to say. And so then you are factoring in where the, where the church is. Like, where, where is the church as an organization? What do they need in order to grow into what God has for them? And then you want to think on an individual level, what is it that the person walking in is going to need? And how can you preach this message in a way that if someone has never walked into a church before, they would be able to get something out of that that would lead them down the path of what God's best was for their life? And then what is, what is it that the most seasoned of believers, what do they need out of this message? And the great thing about God's Word is it's so vast and it's so infinite that when you preach His Word, the Word that He has given you, then it just works on all levels. So today we're going to be talking about vision, and we're going to talk about two stories, uh, one of some blind guys that God healed uh, through Jesus, and, and also the story of Moses when he was out on the backside of the wilderness and how vision played a part in him hearing the voice of God. Before we do, though, I have a quote I was going to read to you, and, and I thought we would start by kind of discussing this. Um, it's Max Dupree said, We cannot become what we need to be by remaining where we are. We cannot become what we need to be by remaining where we are. By a head nod, would you guys agree that that is true? Would you agree? Um, okay, I think it's true. I think that we are constantly evolving in our faith. We should be getting closer to God than when we started. Obviously, when we accepted Christ and we were saved, that was not intended to be the end. And this is a natural progression that happens in all of our relationships. For instance, um, whenever uh, you, you got married, right, uh, for all the married people in the room, um, you were not the person, um, hopefully, that you are now. When, when I got married, I knew nothing about being a husband, right? And all of us that are husbands in the room, like it is a, it is a learning curve, and all the men said, amen, right? It's like, you know, I, it's not like I didn't know how to have a relationship. I knew how to say I love you. I knew how to open a door, you know. I knew how to listen, or at least I thought I did. Um, and so, but, but the husband I was then versus coming into uh, 27 years this coming uh, March, you know, I'm not the husband that I was then. I hope I've gotten better at listening and knowing what my wife needs from me and how that we work in a, in a rhythm. Uh, sometimes we have a weird conversation, and I don't know if you have to be married a certain amount of time, but we have that conversation about, like, what would happen if either of us ever died? Do you guys ever have that? Does that sound dark? Um, but we, we constantly shudder that we would ever have to relearn another person, right? I mean, I feel like 27 years, I finally got this one down, right? 
And I was just imagine, you know, like if I had to ever start over, God forbid, uh, that Carrie passed away or I passed away. And, and we both just talk about that. It'd be so weird uh, getting back out there because we've grown so much. Whenever you had children, right, you definitely, if you thought your child was going to be amazing, right, and never cry and just sleep through the night right out of the womb, like, you were in for a rude awakening, right? Every parent goes through some moments where you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize it was going to be this hard. I mean, you never knew how much you loved sleep until you had a child. And the church said, amen, right? And like for all the moms in the house, and I'm not saying that this isn't true for dads, but I think this is especially true for moms. I think that there's a lot of times where, where you just hear, mom, mom, mom. Is anybody like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like they wait until you've sat down and you have this first moment of peace and quiet, right? And like, even if you, if you, if you like retreat to the bathroom, it's like they're playing just fine. Then you try to go to the restroom and just have a moment of peace and like the little knock at the door, mom, mom. Like, I, that pterodactyl voice is what I do for all children, right? And you're like, what could possibly not wait? Uh, the Wi-Fi's down. You know, whatever, you know. It's just something silly. But my point is, is that you've grown, right? As a parent, as a father, as a mother, as a husband, as a wife, as a friend. When you're leading a company, I promise you if you ever wanted to start a business and you thought, man, I want to start my own business because I don't want to work for the man. You, you were rudely awakened <laughs> to that proposition is very daunting, right? Uh, because the first time that business gets slow, there's not just someone else that's going to pay you. You are in charge of paying you. And so that leads to a lot of stress and a lot of struggle when you're working for yourself. And if you don't adapt, right, if you don't figure it out, then, then all of a sudden, if you're not growing, you're never going to get to the place that God intended you to be. And so life is meant to be a learning process. And this quote, and captures, and captures, <laughs> encapsulates that very thought. So I encourage you today, I want you to start thinking about what is it that God wants you to grow in? Are there any areas that you need to improve? And then how do you go about that process? And I think these two stories are going to give us all the answers that we need. So let's get into Matthew 9, verse 27 through 30. It says, as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, shouting, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men approached him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I can do this? That is going to be the title of today's message. Do you believe that I can do this? Yes, Lord, they answered. Then he touched their eyes, saying, Let it be done for you according to your faith, and their eyes were opened. First question we'll put on the screen, do you believe that I can do this? Or we'll put it in the God framing, do you believe that God can do this? Do you believe that God can do this? Because I assume because you're sitting in a church this morning, right, that you have some assumption that God can do this. So where is the dissonance between you believing God can and then seeing God do that thing in our lives? Because I think a lot of times we believe that God can, but I don't know that our faith is enacted in belief that he can. And so here he said to this, these two blind men, he said, according to your faith, be it done unto you. Do you see how faith played a part in the equation? That if we don't activate our faith along with our belief, then that person should not expect to receive anything from God. He said to these blind men, do you believe that I can do this? And their answer was yes. And then he said, according to your faith, had they not had faith, their eyes would have remained closed. Imagine someone walking in here today, believing that God can but not activating their faith, and they walked in here blind, and they could have had their eyes open, but as a result of them not engaging their faith, all of a sudden, they cannot see. Man, I, I can tell you this, that in every area of your life, the ones I mentioned just a moment ago, if you don't have a vision, right, 
If you don't have a vision for it, then how would you ever know that you arrived, right? Whenever you got married, I promise you, most people got married because they finally said some, met someone that would say yes, okay? That's, that's, the, that's the reason why most people get married, okay? And so, you know, the, but the vision of a lifelong commitment of for better or worse, man, that, that is not the common vision that people have when they're getting married. When they're first getting married, I did a wedding yesterday, by the way, um, lovely couple, uh, the Thatchers, uh, and they were sitting, and you know, it was so cute. They did their own vows, and so like that's like half my job. So there's like, there's wedding vows and there's ring vows, and and they they were so sweet. And one of the lines that the bride had, she said, "You loved me when I couldn't love myself," and I was like, "Oh, dude, are we living in the Notebook right now?" <laughs> We were at the Arboretum, and there's all these flowers around. There was a little violinist lady over there. Woo! I mean, man, it was awesome. And I thought to myself, as young marrieds, you know, like, they have no idea what's coming. <laughs> you know, it's, that's, a, that's a good night, though, that first night. <laughs> if you don't have a vision for your parenting, I promise you, what usually happens is you do not have um, a common vision and it, it never has really uh, crept up on people usually how you're going to raise the child when it comes to the differences in how you were raised. And that's when it comes to the forefront. Has anybody ever seen this happen? Like, you know, in, you never really had like long talks, like what's going to be your discipline strategy? When you were dating, you know, like when we have children, can you imagine like having that conversation on the second date? Like when we have children, how do you think you're going to discipline? You know, that's, it's just not a common conversation. But then when children act up, if you come from different households where one was like super strict and one was like, ah, just let them burn the house down, right? Um, that's, con that's going to lead to conflict, right? And, and so having a vision for how we're going to aim the arrow that is our child, it's incredibly important. And if you don't have one and you have children, you better get one. And I suggest that you find in the scriptures what God says um, about how we aim the arrow, how we parent the child, how we give wisdom that's from above, how we put God first ahead of our own needs or desires. And man, if you learn to have a vision of parenting from a God perspective, Man, the ability for them to have their eyes opened at an early age to the fact that God is real and that God can help them, it's crucial. And so here, these two men walked in blind and they asked Jesus to open their eyes. And Jesus said, if you'll activate your faith, then I will open your eyes. Some of you sitting in the room today, I pray that God would open your eyes. I want you to see exactly what he wants from your life, what he has in store for you. And I want you to know that God has gone on record that he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, more than you could ever ask or imagine. Now, if you're sitting in the room today and you don't feel like you've experienced abundant, more than you could ever ask or imagine, could it be possible that you're sitting in the room, but your eyes are not opened, that you haven't followed and activated your faith, therefore you could be around God in his house, but God is not leading you by his voice. And so I encourage you today, if you don't know how to do that, if you haven't been doing that, if you'd like to learn what that process is like, we're going to spend the second half of the message deciding and discussing exactly how this works. Are you guys ready? So the main part of the message today is Moses. Moses has an interesting backstory, and I never want to make the assumption that everyone knows Moses' story in the room. Um, he was uh, part of the generation that was 400 years after Joseph, and there was um, a genocide pronounced by the Pharaoh at that time and that all of the children, all the boys um, of the Israelites would be killed. And his mom had to put him in this basket and put him in the river. And uh, I can't even imagine as a mom 
you know, well, I mean, I guess with some children, you know, <laughs> you could probably get there. Um, but she drops, you know, baby Moses um, in there and, and God's divine providence. Man, it's just amazing how God has the ability to work things out on our behalf, right? And he worked it out to where Pharaoh's daughter found this baby and took him into the palace, right? And raised him as royalty. And his mom was allowed to come in and be the nurse who was like the surrogate mom. Um, and so God was able to keep the family intact. And God knows how to do these, these crazy, incredible things. However, as Moses grew up, one day there was an Egyptian that was beating up on an Israelite. And Moses had been called to deliver the people. And so I don't know if you've ever tried to do the right thing, but you did it the wrong way. Have you ever tried to <laughs> say the right thing, but you said it the wrong way? Does anybody ever like know what I'm talking about? You know, like, like sometimes you, your heart's in the right place, you know, but you just didn't do it right. You messed it up, right? Well, he, he decided that, that he was going to kill the Egyptian, you know, and he smote him. In the um, Old Testament language, you know, he, he smiteth him. And so um, he killed this Egyptian, and God was like, what are you doing? What are you doing? See, Moses was trying to do God's will his way. And he was trying to accomplish the spiritual deliverance of Israel in the physical way. And God was saying, no, I'm not trying to do it that way. That wasn't my will. That's not what I told you. And so Moses had to flee from the palace. And the next thing you know, he finds himself out in his father-in-law's pasture. His father-in-law was named Jethro. And Jethro had Moses out there taking care of sheep. Now, it was interesting I asked this question in the first service because I was surprised. But I'm going to ask it in the second service. How many of you have ever been on a farm slash worked on a farm? Like, anybody in here? I'm not saying like you like visit like you like petting zoo, okay? Like you were on the farm. Okay, okay, okay. I was, you know, I'm just surprised. You know, I'm from Oklahoma, so, like, there's a lot of farms, you know. I guess it's Texas, you know. I don't know if they have farms up northeast. I don't know what y'all do up there. But, um, hey, hey, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, you know, there are certain commonalities to any farm. And my first job was, was hauling hay. And if you don't know what that's like, there's these square bales, and you got to pick them up, you got to throw them on a truck that's moving like three miles an hour. Sometimes people are driving it, sometimes it's just in gear, okay? And so, uh, and so you throw them on the truck, then you have to take them over to the bar, and all. it's a whole process. But the things that are common on a farm is that they all have a certain smell. You guys have ever been on the farm, right? Just by, yeah, okay. You're like, you, you knew you were at the farm before you got out of the car, right? Oh, we're here, you know, because you know, okay? And, and I, if you've been around long enough, uh, you would know that I, I'm very sensitive to smell, okay? It makes me have this gagging reflex. I never throw up, but it's just like this, ah, you know, and it's terrible. It's terrible. So imagine you're 14 years old. It's 100 degrees. Hay's flying in the air, which I found out I'm allergic to hay. And you're like throwing these bells. And it's like, ah, 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 you know, and... It's terrible. I didn't last long. You know, it's like a, a month that I had to do that job. But um, I tell you what, I, we always preach about David. Remember, he was a shepherd in the pasture. And we always say, man, God took him from the pasture to the palace. And everybody's like, yeah, woo. Well, Moses did it in reverse. God took him from the palace to the pasture. And it's just not as fun when you go that way. I don't know. I don't know if you've ever had a step down in life. Is anybody, I don't, is anybody like, like you used to live in this house and now you like downsized, down, downgraded. I don't know if you ever had like a great job and times got hard. I know COVID impacted a lot of things and like you had to not even take a lateral job. You had to take a lower job. I can tell you when Karen and I moved here from Arkansas, I was the lead pastor of this like church on Main Street, First Baptist Church, and I went from pastoring three to four hundred people to uh, waiting tables at California Pizza Kitchen, and our our church had four people. The four people we moved here with, I'm going to tell you, it did not feel like a step up. It did not. And like here is Moses; he grew up in Pharaoh's house, and now he's wandering around with a bunch of sheep. You know, I mean, he's like meh, meh. You know, and it's like, like imagine, 
the stench that he's around. Now, if you had never been in the palace, you would never appreciate the fact that you're in the pasture. If you'd grown up in the pasture, it seemed like just another day. But he was 40 years out here in the pasture after having only known the palace. Can you imagine how many conversations he had with himself? And the Bible says that for all we know, God was silent. God was silent for 40 years. And he's out here wandering around, talking to himself with a bunch of sheep behind him. The smell is terrible. The conditions aren't great. I know some of you in here, you're campers. You like to go camping. But you always come home to your nice bed, don't you? You're not living out there in it. For some of you that are Frisconians, you know, like, bugs scare me, you know. We, got a, we had a bug in our house <laughs> called the exterminator. Bomb it. I want to see one spider ever. Anyway, just saying. Moses had 40 years of silence from God after he made a mistake. And it was probably pretty reasonable that Moses felt like the page that was going to be in the scriptures in his life had turned. And the great story about Moses was just going to be that he was born and God saved him and put him in Pharaoh's house. But God specializes in second chances, doesn't he? And most of you are in here because God gave you a second chance. And today we're going to read about when God showed up in the middle of the desert while Moses was wandering with a bunch of sheep and he found him and gave him a second chance. Before I even get to that passage, I just want to say, is it possible that you walked in here today and even though on the outside you have the Frisco face on, you know, like, how's it going today? Oh, it's going great, Pastor. You know, y'all just had World War III last night. <laughs> but you walk in here with your smile on, right? And that's what we all do, okay? I'm not saying that you're fake or anything. I'm just saying, you know, in Frisco, we're taught to fake it, right? No, everything's going great here, you know? Yeah. House is falling apart. Yeah, it's great. You know, kids are going crazy. Oh, it's great. You know, yeah, we're just, you know, just a couple bumps in the road. You know, I got it. You know, anyway, but maybe on the inside, you feel like Moses. Maybe on the inside, you feel like it's been a long time since you heard from God. Maybe God's been silent. Maybe you've been running through your mind that mistake, which I'm sure Moses did for 40 years. How did I go from there to here? Has God cast me off forever? And I hope today that if this isn't a message that you need for today, that you'll remember it, because at some point you might need it tomorrow. What do we do when God is silent and when we've made terrible mistakes? How do we recover? It says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side. There was a west side. Um, and so I grew up on the east side of Tulsa, not the palace, okay? Um, it says that he was going to the uh, west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, which is the mountain of God. And just a quick side note, it, it wasn't the mountain of God until Moses had this interaction, then he calls it the mountain of God post the interaction. Verse 2, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called, him, called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. I'm going to walk through this process step by step so that we can understand how do we hear the voice of God and what does our vision have to do with the ability to hear God's voice. First question, what is the message inside 
the miracle? What is the message inside the miracle that was happening there? See, every time God show, is showing you something that he is doing, he has a message wrapped inside of it. For some of you, it might have been an interaction out in the lobby that he had a message wrapped inside. Hey, there is a church that actually cares. There, is, there are people that actually are friendly. Uh, there are people that uh, care even if they don't know who I am or even if I don't perceive that I have something to bring to the table. Maybe it was in the song that we sang just a moment ago, whenever we know that we need God to fall on us, that we need His Spirit, that we need the gift from God this morning, the gift of grace, the gift of healing, the gift of mercy, the gift of redemption, whatever it is. But here is a message that is wrapped up inside of this moment. And today I want to unwrap three of the things that were inside of that miracle. Number one, Moses is getting this message from this interaction. God says, I am not confined to your normal. I am not confined to your normal. You see, Moses had never been walking along uh, in, the, in the mountain with the sheep and came across a bush that was on fire, but it wasn't consumed. And so when we're walking along, God is trying to give us things that are in our life. And he's saying that just because this isn't normal for you doesn't mean that it's not normal for me. See, we can do so many things, but we can't do what God can do. Only God can do, right, what God can do. So you might have walked into a service today and you might be saying to yourself, well, this this doesn't seem normal. This doesn't feel normal. Could it be that God is trying to get a hold of your heart? And a lot of times that's uncomfortable, right? We walk in and we just want to hear a nice sermon that Jesus loves me the way I am and I can keep doing the things that I'm doing. No, at some point the truth has to interact with your sin and the truth has to interact and challenge you to even go further than you have before. And God is saying that just because it isn't normal doesn't mean that I can't do it. Number two, he says, I can do more than you've ever seen before. I can do more than you've ever seen before. Man, Moses has never seen this. Whenever we think about our past experiences, right? A lot of times it's those past experiences that confine whatever we think God can do. So if God has never done it before, we believe that God can never do it now. And so what if God is trying to press you this morning with a message that says, you know what? The same question that he asked to the blind guys is the same question he has for you. Do you believe that I can do this? Do you believe that I can fix the broken things that are in your life? Do you believe that I can take the habit that is hurting you away from you and replace it with a better behavior? Do you believe that I can make the love return once it's grown cold? Do you believe that I can take the passion that once burned so bright inside of you to do the Lord's work, to do the Lord's will. And now, because you've gotten busy and you've gotten distracted, it has faded and it is far from you. Do you believe that I can bring that back again? You see, I think inside of this fire, on this bush that was burned but yet not consumed, he says, I can do things that you've never seen before. And I believe in this building with the people that are sitting in this room, I believe that God is going to do things that he has never done before. Greater things than we have ever seen at our church. The last message inside the miracle, God says, I'm able to preserve things that should have been consumed. Now, do you think that that was important to Moses? You guys, you guys kind of get the picture here? Moses is 40 years cast off. And the sign from God is a very unimportant bush that is now on fire, but it's not being consumed. Isn't God amazing that he can preserve things that should have been consumed I just want to ask you in your life, have you ever done something so dumb that you shouldn't be sitting in here today? Does anybody have a testimony like, like have, you ever, have you ever said something that maybe could have even affected your marriage? Have you ever said something so dumb, you're like, whew, you're like, whew, 
You ever had a moment with your children where you said something or you did something and you feel like the worst parents in the world? Because none of us are going to get it right all the time. It's impossible, right? And so whenever we have those moments, if we sit down in that, then we feel like we are going to be consumed. And by some of our choices that we've made, we should have been consumed. Long ago, we should have been cast off. We should have been forgotten. How many times have we told God, God, if you get me through this, then I will do this. And then God gets you through that, and you didn't do jack, bro. You, you just kept on doing it again, again, and again. And yet God keeps on trying to find you, even in the middle of the wilderness with a bunch of sheep and a bunch of stink. He has the ability to come looking for you, and he says, I know how to preserve things that should have been consumed a long time ago. Isn't that message of redemption something we all need to hear today that may be wrapped up inside of this message is a story for you that though you should have been consumed by some of the bad choices that you made, and though God might have been silent for a certain season in your life, just because he's silent for a season doesn't mean that your situation is done because he knows how to preserve things that should have been consumed. And the church said, amen. All right. Oh, we're not even there yet. Just get ready. It says that when Moses saw this, what? look, verse 2. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. So we have two different looks. We have the first look and the second look. The first look is limited, okay? Whenever you're going through life, if you live at first blush, if you take things at face value, then you're going to miss out on the greater meaning that God is trying to get to you. For instance, he could have been walking along and, you know, I don't know if y'all know how sheep work, but they just, they don't, they don't listen, okay? It's like they have to have these sticks and then they have to have these dogs that help them. It's like, it's a constant job all day, all night. You just got to herd these sheep and you got to herd them because they're trying to wander off, right? They're trying to wander over here and try to, and you can imagine how frustrated you'd get, you know, like Larry, he names them all, right? It's like Larry, the sheep, he's always wandering off, right? He's jumping in a ditch. I got to go get him. I get him out of the ditch. He jumps back in the ditch. And you can imagine these conversations that Moses is having and he's having them with sheep. Do you understand like where your life has gone to that you were dining with the finest wine and the best food in Pharaoh's house and then you kill one Egyptian and now you're on the run and you're talking with sheep out in the middle of the desert. And he could have walked by this burning bush and he could have said, oh, well that's interesting. He'd have got home and told the wife, yeah, there's, I don't know, there's a bush that was on fire. I, but I had to, you know, I had to get the sheep over to the other pasture and, you know, I had to make sure that I was home because you told me don't be late or, you know, there's not going to be any romantic time. Anyway, there was all these common conversations and all these busyness, all these every day in the mundane, right? And God met him in his mundane, and he said that he saw something, and it caught his eye. But if we live at the first look, and we never take the second look, we never drill down deeper, then we'll miss out on the message that God is trying to give to us. If we stay at face value and refuse to add faith, we'll never get the message that God was trying to give us. This morning you walked in here, and I promise you, some of you are going to take this worship service at first look, right? It's going to be at, you're going to take it at face value. And I can tell you exactly how I know, all right? Because when we are worshiping, some of you, this is the way you worship, right? Some of you like kind of mouth the, song, the words, you know, and uh, we have little microphones on all the chairs and we monitor it. <laughs> it's a new feature in the building. We're like, fall like rain, fall like rain. And I, I'm going to pick on the dudes for just a second because ladies, you just are just naturally better at singing. Um, not all of you, but most of you. <laughs> But when it comes to the dudes, a lot of dudes are like, dude, I, that's not what I do. That's not what I do. I don't sing, you know. But put some Garth on, you'll sing. Anyway, um, 
hair bands, whatever you're into, okay? Put some Bon Jovi on, everybody in this building would sing. I guarantee you. So don't tell me you don't sing. You just don't sing in church, right? Because maybe there's not just strangers sitting beside you ever in your car as you're listening to your music. I get it. It could be weird, right? It could be weird. But if you're going to walk in here and take the service and the message and, and, and keep it at the surface value and you're there only to, to be a spectator but not to participate, I'm just going to tell you that God has so much more if you would be willing to step outside of what is your comfort zone and you would participate in the worship process. For instance, last week during the reflection time, there were several sets of fathers and sons. And I was watching these fathers and sons, and, and they're up here, and they're, they're worshiping together. And I thought, man, if there was ever a picture that could be painted about what we're trying to accomplish is generational change and a father worshiping with his son. I can't tell you how many women along the way have told me when their husband started passionately pursuing after God and worshiping him at church, that's the man that I wanted to marry. That's the man I've been looking for. That's the father I want for my children. See, guys, if you stay at first look and you never drill down to the second level. You never figure out what it is that God wants with your life. You can be around God and God be doing incredible things. He's like, Moses, here is your sign. And Moses could have been so busy that he walked by and said, that's cool. <laughs> that was a good service. That was a good song. That was a good sermon. But he just kept walking without changing. It says that Moses took a second look. Look at verse 3. He says, I will turn aside and see this great sight. He's looking at it, but he says, I'm going to turn aside and see it again. But I'm going to shift my perspective. You see, the first look didn't get to the why. Do you notice that in that verse? See the why? He's going to see why it isn't burned. See, the first look will never get you to the why. See, the why of your marriage not working right now, the why of your finances being broken, the why of you struggling with purpose or passion, the why that you can't get past the depression or the fear and the anxiety, the why is that first look is never going to get you to the why. It was that second look that unlocked everything. It says, when he turned aside to see what he was already looking at, he heard the voice of God calling out to him, Moses, Moses. Whenever we think about that second look, there's a second look that says there has to be something more. The second look is hungry to want to know what God wants from my life, that I want to hear that familiar voice that I haven't heard in a very long time. You see, he had to add faith to his focus, and the second look added faith to the equation. Now I'm not just seeing it, I'm going to turn aside and see what God is trying to do. And all of a sudden, when he turned aside to see it from a spiritual perspective, instead of just a physical perspective, he heard the voice of God calling out to him. So I'm saying to you, you might be looking at the same situation that you walked in here with, but what if you shifted your perspective and said, God, what do you want me to see? Add faith and then tell me what you see. Add faith and then tell me what you hear. Add faith and then tell me how you feel. You say the love is God. I say hold on, shift your perspective and let God speak into you and watch the love come back into your life. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? Add faith to your focus and the church said amen. seems like both of these passages are dealing with the same question, right? Do you believe I can do this? And we see that there's a connection between vision 
and God's voice. Until he had the right vision, he couldn't hear God's voice. Man, if Moses wanted to overcome his past mistakes, he had to have the right vision and he had to be guided by the right voice. If Moses wanted to achieve his intended purpose, he had to have the right vision guided by the right voice. Now let's imagine all those people that were in Egypt ready to be set free. If he wanted to set captives free, he had to have the right vision and he had to hear and obey the right voice. It was all unlocked in one shift of perspective. What if you walked in here looking at a surface level and your situation is never going to change? You say, I've gone to church all my life. It ain't about you going to church, fool. <laughs> Do you understand that? There's a bunch of terrible people that go to church. Going to church doesn't do anything. At some point, you got to activate your faith. And he says, according to your faith, be it done unto you. Your eyes are going to be opened as a result of you believing in a God that can do something for you that you could never do for yourself. But at some point, you got to believe that in order to receive what God has for you. Now, as soon as he did this, he heard the voice of God. Some of you, if I ask you, when is the last time you clearly heard God speaking into your life? You would struggle to remember the last time that that occurred. Is it because you went from looking for what God was doing to looking to just accomplish today's task? I'm just going to make it through another day. I'm just going to make it through another week. I'm just going to make it through another month. But you never take the time to say, God, what do you want me to see? God, what are you trying to accomplish in this? God, I want your will for my life. All these souls are waiting in Egypt to be set free, and Moses holds the key, whether or not he'll stop and say, what is God trying to get to me today? I hope that everyone in here would realize that you could walk into the same sermon. You could, matter of fact, we could say from the moment that you walked in here till right now, you could be seeing me from a shallow physical surface perspective and you won't have seen God move. But if we shifted your perspective eight inches from your heart to your head and from your head to your heart, if we shifted your perspective that much, all of a sudden your eyes could be open and I promise you when the band stepped out and began playing the song, even if you didn't know it, your mouth would open, your heart would flood with God's spirit and you would want to worship the God who created you, who opened your eyes. Some of you have forgotten. Do you remember the first time God opened your eyes? When he saved you from your sins? you remember that? Can you remember how clean you felt? how forgiven you felt, that you had this sense of life is now inside of me and greater purpose than you could possibly imagine. What happened to that? What happened to that? You see, life just has a way of sending us seasons where God is silent and maybe I'm not following as close as I used to. But if you wanted to get on track today, this story tells me that you're one shift away from God changing everything in your life. And it has nothing to do with your ability. Moses' first argument was, God, I can't do it. I'm not eloquent. How is Pharaoh going to listen to me? And he gave God all these reasons why he can't. And God says, I know you can't, fool. <laughs> That's why I picked you. It's not about what you can do. It's about what I can do through you. If you'll just show up and let me use your life, then I'll do greater things with your life than you could ever do on your own. Just open your eyes this morning. Maybe take a second look at your faith and maybe ask God, God, I want your will more than anything else in my life. And I promise you, I promise you, the moment you pray that, your eyes will be opened and you will hear God saying, 
This is exactly what I want from your life. Let's pray. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus, God, give us grace. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. God, that you are able to find us. And maybe someone is trying to be found right now, God, that they hear your voice, God, calling out to them, saying, I have a better way. I have a better plan. There is hope still. Just because you made a mistake back then doesn't mean that you have to pay for it for the rest of your life. Just because you've gone from the palace to the pasture doesn't mean I still don't have purpose for your life. God, I pray for every family in here that they would experience God's absolute best. And for any man sitting in the room that is consumed with being macho and acting like you have it all together when inside you are falling apart, I pray that you would humble yourself today and be the man that God called you to be. For any wife that is on the edge of throwing in the towel and giving up, giving in to the stress and the anxiety and the struggle, I pray that you would hear my voice today telling you God can God can save it. God can fix it. The only question you have to answer this morning is, do you believe God can do this? And if you're convinced the answer is yes to that, then what in the world is holding you back? We're going to sing this song of reflection today, and we're going to invite you to sing with us. Would you guys stand and worship with us?